Hello, everybody. Happy Monday afternoon. Hope yours is going well. We've got another Seahawks video to get to today, but first we just hit 2,180 subscribers to the YouTube channel. I want to give a shout out to all the subscribers, and as always, special tip of the cap goes to the channel members, including new channel member Aiden Reynolds and new channel elite member Salacious Crumb. He joins the list of elite channel members that includes Y2KHA, Brandon McKell, Rip, Scott Todd, Hasher for MVP, VGK Tiger 75, and John Harper. Today is going to be a little bit more of what I would call a fluff piece. This is more of a for fun video than analyzing anything that's overly high stakes or crucial to this team's success. This is going to kind of be just for fun because the way I see it, the team has earned a little bit of a fluff piece because. They've won three in a row. They won a huge divisional game to clinch the division. They've got 11 wins with one game to go, which is in line with my expectations this season. And things are just going pretty well right now. And the way I see it, the team deserves a little bit of what I guess you could call is a fluff piece. So next week, we got the 49ers going to Arizona or San Francisco to play them. We don't know yet. But we know we're playing the 49ers, and we also know there's a real possibility the game will mean nothing for the Seahawks going forward. We know we're in the playoffs. We know we have at least the three seed. Unfortunately, we're not going to know before our game starts whether or not we have anything to play for because the Packers and Saints games have been moved. Regardless, we know it's very likely that the Seahawks have nothing to play for because the Packers losing to the Bears seems like a little bit of a long shot. And the Panthers losing to the Saints seems like a roughly equivalent long shot. So we might not have anything to play for in terms of a win versus a loss next week. It is possible that a win and a loss will both mean exactly the same thing to the Seahawks as they go into the playoffs. So in this video, we're going to try to figure out some other stuff to root for next week against the 49ers because the win may not mean anything to us, but... There is some stuff that is going to happen on the field next week that could matter to some of these players. So I made a list, and I made a list of every statistical milestone that a Seahawks player has a chance to either reach or surpass next week against the 49ers. And in lieu of placing a lot of importance on getting this win, maybe it's going to be a little more fun if we place some importance on on getting some of these statistical milestones because, hey, the players, it could have been better. We could have beaten Arizona in overtime. We could have beaten the Giants with Colt McCoy, of course. We all wish we had those games back, but to this point, the season's gone pretty well, and we have some great players who are doing great things. So in honor of their success so far this season, let's go through some stuff that we can root for next week against the Niners. Let's start with Russell Wilson, the highest paid player on the team. Maybe he's not the team MVP right now, but over this season, he certainly has been. He's having one of the best seasons any Seahawk player has ever had. By the way, sorry if you can hear the construction going on back there, if there's some work going on back there. But um, Russell Wilson has the following things maybe in the back of his mind next week against the Niners. He needs 32 pass attempts to break his personal single season record of 553. He needs 41 pass attempts to break the franchise record of 562 set by Matt Hasselbeck in 07. So that's doable. Granted, I don't know if he's going to play the whole game. I don't even know if he's going to play more than a couple of drives. But it is feasible to throw the ball 41 times in one football game. So these milestones, not that these are necessarily amazing milestones to have, they're both in reach. He also needs to hold his completion percentage above 68.1%. It is currently at 69.7% in order to break his personal record from 2015. And his personal record is also the franchise record. But not only that, if he can push his completion percentage up just three-tenths of a percent, which is doable in one game, one full game of a high completion percentage, you can push it up. 0.3%. It would be the 18th season in NFL history where a QB had a full slate 
of attempts and still managed to keep his completion percentage above 70. The 18th season in NFL history of a completion percentage above 70. So that would be pretty cool. Not something that you see all that often, although it's getting more and more common these days. He also needs 189 passing yards to break his personal single season record, which is also the franchise record, of 4,219 yards, which he set in 2016. So this is very doable in one game. It might even be doable in one half. But if he can just get to 189 passing yards against the 49ers, that's his new personal best and a new franchise best. We all thought when this season started, Wilson was going to set the touchdown record on fire. We thought he was going to throw 60 touchdowns this year. Well, it didn't work out that way. Nevertheless, if he throws two touchdowns against the 49ers, he will get to 40 on the season. Only 14 players in NFL history have thrown for 40 or more touchdowns in one season. So two more touchdowns, and he will have the 15th ever season of 40 or more touchdown passes. So that's still a pretty exclusive club. And finally, he needs 16 rushing yards to have his fifth season of his career with at least 500 rushing yards. Now, in my research, as near as I could tell, the record for most seasons by a quarterback with 500 or more rushing yards is held by Randall Cunningham and Michael Vick, who had six. So if he can get 16 rushing yards against the 49ers he will be one season of 500 or more rushing yards short of tying the all-time record for a QB. <clears throat> and clearly, running the ball is not something that Wilson is including in his game as much as he used to, but 16 yards is very doable for him in one game. All right, now we move on from Wilson. Let's go to Chris Carson. Nothing big here, but I want to go ahead and celebrate Chris Carson anyway because for all we know, this Sunday's game will be the last regular season game Chris Carson ever plays for the Seahawks. I think it's very possible. He needs one more catch, one more reception to get to 100 career receptions, and he needs two receiving yards for his second straight 250 receiving yard plus season. Again, these are minor, minor milestones, but I think they're neat. I think they're nice because he is a running back who came into this league with not a tremendous resume of being a receiver out of the backfield. So... If he can get one more catch and two more receiving yards, those are two minor milestones for Chris Carson. All right, DK Metcalf. He has two big milestones right in his, right in front of him, right in front of his windshield. If he can get six receiving yards against the 49ers, that is the franchise record. Six receiving yards will get him to 1,288, which passes the franchise record set by Steve Largent in 1985. Furthermore, if he gets three receptions, that will be the fifth highest total for a Seahawk in a single season in franchise history. That would put him at 83. 83 would move him past, I think it's Bobby Engram for fifth most in a single season. And Wow, somebody back there really doesn't like me shooting videos, but you know what? We're going to plow on. We're going to find a way, guys. Sorry about that. Jeez. All right, Tyler Lockett. He needs seven receptions against the 49ers for the franchise record of 95, set by Engram in 07 and Baldwin in 2016. Now, because of the way Lockett has played lately, this seems unlikely. And frankly, I think a lot of us would rather see Tyler Lockett take this game off and maybe not play at all. But if he does play, and if he does get involved in the game plan, it's well within reach. He also needs... 36 receiving yards for his second straight, th excuse me, <clears throat> for his second straight thousand yard receiving season, receiving yard season. So 36 receiving yards and it gets him to a thousand again. And that's significant for him because he was not a thousand yard receiver in any season prior to last year. So hopefully he can get there. I'm rooting for him. 58 receiving yards on the week 17 game and he will pass Bobby Engram for fifth all time in franchise history that would get him to 4,860 which would put him one yard ahead of where Bobby Engram is on the all-time team receiving chart he also needs 94 receiving yards against the Niners for his new personal best that would put him at 1,058 receiving yards that would put him one yard ahead of what he did last year 
And finally, he needs one touchdown, receiving touchdown, that is, to pass Daryl Turner for fifth most touchdowns in franchise history at 36. So Lockett has some stuff to play for. He might not play at all on Sunday for all we know, but something to keep an eye on. For all we know, this Seahawks team is going to take the field with 100% dedication to trying to get a win. So only time will tell. Okay, that takes care of the offense. Let's move on to the defense and find some milestones for these guys. Bobby Wagner. Of course Bobby's playing for some important milestones because he's just been around so long. And you guys know I'm not a big fan of the way Bobby Wagner's been playing lately. And overall this season, I don't think he's been as good as I wanted him to be. But nevertheless, he is on target to do some pretty notable stuff this season and possibly reach some notable milestones in this final game. So let's go through it. If he gets one solo tackle against the 49ers, he passes Jeremiah Trotter and enters the top 50 all-time list for most solo tackles. That would put him at 724, and that would make him 50th in NFL history in solo tackles. So pretty, pretty big, pretty exclusive company. Even more exclusive company would be if he got to eight total tackles against the 49ers. That would put him past Paul Puzlozny, remember him, and it would put him in the top 30 all-time in NFL history for total tackles. It would put him at 1,215. So pretty remarkable pretty high praise. It's it's notable of a pretty long career of doing getting a lot of tackles. It's meaningful stuff, even if he's not playing exactly the way we would like right now. Furthermore, he also needs to have one pass defense against the 49ers, one pass deflection, however you want to put it, to pass Sean Springs for fifth most passes defensed in NFL history. It would put him at 56. Sean Springs is currently at 55, so they're tied right now. Another pass defense for Bobby would put him fifth all-time. He also needs two quarterback hits. Just two quarterback hits. I know this is a recent stat, but two quarterback hits would pass Chris Clemens for third in franchise history with 77. Again, recent stat. They didn't keep track of QB hits for players like Cortez Kennedy and Jacob Green, so it's not really third in franchise history, but officially it would be. Okay, next up we got K.J. Wright. If he gets one forced fumble against the 49ers, if he forces one fumble, he will pass Earl Thomas for third most forced fumbles in team history with 12. And if he can get two pass defenses against the 49ers, he will pass Sean Springs for fifth in franchise history, just like Bobby Wagner can. K.J.'s one pass deflection behind Bobby Wagner. So they're basically right neck and neck with each other, basically, at this point. Okay, Jamal Adams is next. Jamal Adams has 10 tackles for loss on the season. If he gets one more, that will make it his personal best. 10 is the most tackles for loss he's ever had in one season. If he can get one more, that's a new record for him. He's still young. It's not the most meaningful thing in the world, but it's something for him to play for if he plays next week. And finally, if he gets another half sack, he can have double digits on the season Obviously, he already owns the all-time record for sacks by a defensive back, but 0.5 more would give him double digits, which would, hey, would be historic in its own way. All right, now we're moving on to some smaller stuff. Jordan Brooks needs two tackles against the 49ers to get to 50 as a rookie, and I think that is actually kind of meaningful because he hasn't played a ton and he's a rookie coming in off a bum off season. So if he can get to 50 total tackles this season, I would say that's a milestone worth considering. I know it's not a huge number. I know a lot of those tackles were not the most meaningful tackles he ever made. But hey, I'll take what I can get from this rookie class. Jerron Reed needs six total tackles against the 49ers to get to 200 for his career. Not a huge thing, but we're going to celebrate every little victory we can get right now because hey... This game might not count for a ton in the actual playoff seedings. Next up, Alton Robinson needs one more sack to get to five total sacks as a rookie. Hey, I've seen a ton of players pass through Seattle and get five or more sacks in a season, but a fifth round rookie with a bum off season? This is good, man. This is some nice stuff, and Alton Robinson has exceeded my expectations so far, and I'm going to go ahead and celebrate it because, hey, today's a day for celebrating, right? And there's a good chance that next week will be too, regardless of the outcome. So 
Let's celebrate what we can celebrate. And finally, let's go to the special teams. The Seahawks' pretty spectacular special teams through 15 games. Jason Myers, maybe the team MVP. I'm just kidding, but he's had an amazing season. If Jason Myers does not miss a field goal against the 49ers, regardless of whether or not he kicks one, if he does not miss against the Niners, he will have the ninth ever season of 10 or more field goal attempts with zero misses, and he will have the third ever season of 20 or more field goal attempts with zero misses. Only two players in NFL history, I think Gary Anderson and Olindo Mare or Garrett Hartley, I can't remember which one, but one of those two guys had seasons where they had this many attempts with no misses. So Jason Myers may very well be concluding one of the best seasons in NFL history by a kicker, especially if he doesn't come through with a miss against the Niners. So rooting for that. And then Michael Dixon. What does he have on the line? Well, if Michael Dixon can boost his yards per punt by seven-tenths of a yard, he will have his ninth ever season no, no, the ninth ever season in NFL history of at least 50 yards per punt. He's currently at 49.3. If he can get to 50 by increasing his yards per punt by 0.7 yards, it will be the ninth season in NFL history by a qualified punter who had of, of 50 or more yards per punt. If he can boost his yards per punt by 0.3 yards, which is even easier, it will be a top 10 season ever for any qualified punter for yards per punt at 49.6. So Michael Dixon may very well be wrapping up one of the greatest seasons by a punter in NFL history as well. And that gets us to the end. These are all the things I could find that are going to be kind of interesting to watch for. Again, we don't know if we're going to care if we beat the 49ers, so let's find something else to care about. And... These players who have given us this so far fairly successful season, I, I know it hasn't been perfect, but it got us the division crown. It got us to at least 11 wins. It got us the three seed at the minimum. So let's hope these guys can come through and really take it home and get to some franchise or NFL milestones before it's all over. So with all that said, I'm going to get out of here. Peace out, Go Hawks. Stream later. I may post another video later if we get some updates on the situations of Josh Gordon, but more than likely just come out later tonight for the streams. And uh, yeah, peace out, Go Hawks. Step on up, everybody. Who wants to hit some big time NFL Seahawk milestones?